Stanford University. Good evening, everybody. Glad to see you again uh, this week. How many of you had dinner so far tonight? <laughs> it's your last meal. <laughs> I won't ask you what you ate, but I think you'll have a different viewpoint about that when we're done this evening. So tonight we're going to focus on what is a really important issue, and increasingly so uh, in this country and in fact around the world, and that is weight and eating. Um, and, of course, obesity. And the reasons why I wanted this topic uh, to be discussed tonight is in part because if you look at what's happened in this country um, and projections that have been done, we've watched, as the world has watched, um, our longevity increase uh, over time. And there have been a number of studies that have suggested that there are at least, but particularly, two factors um, that could contribute to a change in longevity. One we've talked about in past sessions, and that is a pandemic of some kind for which we're ill-equipped and our immune system is not functioning very well, and that could have a pretty devastating impact. And the second uh, is that of obesity, partly because of all of the secondary consequences that occur um, from that. So tonight we have two um, very different speakers uh, from different who approach this problem from very different points of view, um, but they share in common a focus on uh, the challenges uh, of obesity. So uh, Tom Robinson, who will be our second speaker tonight, uh, is trained in pediatrics. He actually had his origins here at Stanford. He was an undergraduate here, went to medical school along the way, um, did an MPH at Berkeley, uh, and then trained in pediatrics at the same institution I did some time ago, the Children's Hospital in Boston. And after he got his taste and got the stamp, uh, he left and came back uh, west and joined the community here in uh, Palo Alto and at Stanford, where he has become one of our nation's leaders uh, in the issues of obesity, particularly focusing on children, but with obviously a lot of extrapolation um, to adults as well. And the way he's approached um, this problem is from that of point of view of a clinical scientist who has a um, broader sociological point of view. And so his studies uh, have really looked at the lifestyle consequences of, um, that impact on many of our choices that start uh, in children and extend all the way up um, through adulthood, including some uh, an interesting piece that I uh, read just today or saw today in the Stanford Medicine uh, on his sleuthing uh, of trying to get undergraduates to like their vegetables. Um, I hope you're going to tell us about that because uh, uh, I'm still working on that. Uh, and then um, following, uh, well, actually preceding um, Tom uh, is going to be uh, John Morton. And John uh, approaches the problem of, of obesity from a different perspective. Um, he is a uh, surgeon uh, who is the director of the bariatric uh, program here at Stanford who uses surgical technologies and techniques to deal um, with individuals who become morbidly obese. Now, interestingly, like uh, Tom, uh, he has had some overlapped um, training. He uh, did not start out at Stanford. We're glad he wound up here, but he began his work at Tulane, where he was both an undergraduate uh, and a medical student. Um, he did an MPH uh, there, and along the way uh, did some policy work. Um, he did some with Bill Frist uh, when uh, he was um, in the Senate and did a, a master's degree in health policy at the University of Washington while he was doing his surgical training here, there, and then joined um, the faculty here at Stanford. So two perspectives, um, two ways of thinking about the problem, one focusing on adults, one uh, on uh, children, connecting uh, in the middle, hopefully, uh, and that middle will be slender uh, as we go forward. Uh, so we'll start with uh, John Morton. Well, I want to thank our dean uh, for the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. And as he mentioned, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about obesity and how to deal with it. Both Dr. Robinson and I have the same goal, which is to do something about this enormous problem that we're all dealing with. And we take different approaches to it. 
Uh, but you'll see that, again, the common goal is to do something about this. And as you can tell from this slide, it's a big problem, no pun intended, one that's getting worse over time. And if you take a look at the last bullet point behind me, that's the one that's most concerning. And that's looking at the fact that 75% of our kids grow up to be obese adults. That figure is taken from the Bogalusa Heart Study. I went to school in New Orleans. Bogalusa is right outside of, of New Orleans, and that's where we learned about that. Dr. Robinson's going to talk to you a little bit more about pediatrics, but I think the one thing to know is you can't treat the child or any family member in isolation. You have to treat the whole family. It's kind of like treating a child with asthma and sending them home to a, a home full of smokers. You still need to treat the entire family. So it's something to kind of remember and keep in mind as we look at this big problem. And people often ask, what causes obesity? You may think it's a simple equation of thermodynamics, energy in, energy out, but you can see there, there's a very long laundry list of all the different things that can uh, contribute towards obesity. I think the one thing that we do know, it's ancient genes in a modern environment. Maintaining your weight was a good thing back when we were on the savanna. Not so good now where you've got 7-Elevens, McDonald's everywhere, so it's not uh, as conducive as it was in the past. The other thing we know is that clearly our lifestyle has changed. Our ability to exercise, our ability to eat the right kind of vegetables, Stanford undergrads uh, notwithstanding. Uh, and you can see there that all those things have changed. I want to introduce one more concept to, if you will, the three pillars of weight maintenance. There are three things, it's diet, exercise, and sleep. You know, we've got a lot of epidemics in this country. One of those epidemics, though, is people not sleeping enough. Believe it or not, the next day when you don't sleep enough, you're tired, and where do you get your energy from? It's usually from caffeine or it's from food. It's something to keep in mind. The sleep doctors who look at this very closely um, have been hungering for some sort of marker to tell see them someone's sleep deprived. And it turns out it's the same thing as a hunger hormone that I'll tell you a little bit about in a second. So sleep's very important, and, and we in medicine are very much in tune for that. I remember very distinctly as an intern uh, gaining weight, not realizing it because you wear those scrub pants, and uh, you show up for Thanksgiving dinner and wonder why the dry cleaner shrunk your pants. But it has a lot to do with your lifestyle and your inability to uh, get healthy rest. Now, what else can cause it? Everybody's heard about uh, high fructose corn syrup. This is a nice study that was done that looked at uh, the impact of those additives to your diet. If you look behind me, there's some of the concept in medicine we call dose dependent. And if you see here, it's, it's a very nice kind of stepladder approach to weight gain and also has impact on some of the uh, bad cholesterol here, something called triglycerides. So as you have more and more of these additives, it does impact your ability to gain weight, and unfortunately can have bad impact on your cholesterol as well. How about a plain old diet and exercise? Whatever happened to that? Well, take a look here. This is taken from the Department of Transportation, and you can see here that one line shows you how many kids either walked or biked to school back in the 1960s, and now it's up to date into the early uh, 2000s. You can see it went from almost half of the uh, school kids to probably less than 10%. So big changes in how people exercise. How about diet? You can see here the big thing that's probably changed uh, has been the portion sizes. And you can see them over time. If you take a look at these, that they've increased gradually. And you can see the different colors. But the one place where it's really increased in terms of portions are soft drinks. You can see that they've become mega, colossal, super, gigantic, whatever you want to call them from whatever you go, they've gotten huger and huger with time. Other impacts, let's take a look at how we uh, depict food throughout time, right? People may have seen this uh, a painting before, The Last Supper. You heard our dean mention it a little bit earlier. Well, a very interesting study that came out of Cornell looked at the size of those portions that were at The Last Supper over time. <laughs> Now you wonder, how did he do this? How did he standardize it? Well, he, he did a smart thing. He correlated it to the size of the disciples' heads and looked at, you know, to see if the portion sizes had changed. And sure enough, take a look. <laughs> Even in the Last Supper, it's gotten bigger over time. So <laughs> one other aspect, you know, people ask, okay, a lot of other things contributing. How about the economy? Well, we all know the people who carry extra weight, and I prefer that term. And, contradistinction to uh, morbidly obese, it's a bit pejorative, but people who carry extra weight, you can see here, uh, tend to be uh, more from the lower socioeconomic uh, school, and you can see that it has a lot to do with how they live. 
limited access to health care, limited access to healthy foods. Not all of these people have access to farmers markets and other things that they can avail themselves to. And when you have that kind of insecurity about food, it kind of lends itself to binging. Here comes Friday when you can get that paycheck or you can get uh, whatever sort of assistance you can have and you tend to blow it out. And you can do that uh, with food because food tends to be pretty expensive. It's one of the few luxuries in life that people can't afford. Now the other side of the coin that's quite interesting if you take a look at this is some economists, and economists are interesting people, aren't they? Look at what they did here. They took a look at the impact of uh, economic productivity over time and its impact on mortality. And they found that during those periods of increased productivity and economic expansion, uh, adjusted mortality rates went up. And you can see how they accounted for some of that. It has to do a little bit with stress, has to do a little bit with not sleeping enough. Um, and all of those things come into play. And you can see how even the economy can play some impact here. Now, I want to bring up one last point about his causes. And this is, uh, people may have heard about the study, your friends can make you fat. Well, it's not your friends that make you fat. It's the fact that you go out with people who have similar lifestyles and habits. And it decreases your threshold, if you will, for what you're going to eat. And this study was very interesting. It's from the Framingham Heart Study. I mentioned the Bogalusa Heart Study, which is the pediatric uh, cardiac study. Well, Framingham is a world famous uh, longitudinal study of cardiac risk over time. And you, they followed out these people. And what they found is if you had an obese friend or if you had an obese family member, your risk of becoming obese really increased down the road. Now, let's define obesity. And I always like to use our paragon of physical health here, our governor, and you can see him there. <laughs> and probably the simplest thing uh, for definition uh, is BMI. You can see the uh, governor there in 1975. He was Mr. Universe. A few years later, uh, I, don't, I don't bring that up to, uh, uh, to knock our governor, but I want to point out, happens to even to Mr. Universe, OK? Now, let's define these degrees of obesity. In a lot of ways, if people are familiar with the classifications for cancer, stage 1, 2, and terminal stage 4, the WHO, World Health Organization, has organized the classifications for obesity along the same sort of ranking system, if you will. Normal is about 18 and a half to 25. Overweight is 25 to 30. The median, the average BMI in this country is 27. That means fully half of this country is overweight. Then we get to class one, obesity, BMI of 30 to 35, severely obese, 35 to 40, morbidly obese, stage three, and I don't even have the last one here, but it's stage four, which is BMI over 50. And you can see that when all of those uh, increases in weight occur, you can also have increases in comorbidities, medical problems associated with, with that extra weight, and it's literally from head to toe. But the ones that have the most impact at the end of the day are things like diabetes, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, cholesterol issues, but there are, other more, there are more comorbidities out there. It does not matter what field of medicine you, you practice in or what you go into as a resident student, you're going to deal with the obese patient at one point or another. And you can see here from head to toe, we have to contend with some of those issues. Now this shows uh, that there is an emerging diagnosis here and it's called diabesity. There is both the component of obesity and diabetes and you can see here very easily that as uh, we've progressed with time, we've also progressed with increase in both diabetes and obesity. This shows you again the rates of hypertension that correspond very closely to those rates of obesity. And one thing we should keep in mind with all the impacts that we've had in healthcare, getting better certainly at heart disease, uh, the biggest improvement there was probably smoking sensation. But unfortunately as we've gotten better with smoking, we've gotten worse uh, with uh, weight. And so as we um, go down with smoking, BMI is going up. You can see here that the obesity prevalence rates in this one slide that you can see there look very much like those heart disease slides where you see the prevalence of heart disease. So those two track very closely together. And unfortunately, when you carry that extra weight, you carry those extra medical problems, you carry increased risk of early death. And that's what this slide depicts here. It's kind of in a J-shaped curve. Being too low is not good either. Being less than 18 is not good. Uh, but certainly as you go up in your BMI, and you can see that towards the bottom here, your risk of mortality really starts to climb. If you can make out here, this is a BMI of 40. So at this point, these doesn't even enter into some of the patients that we deal with. Now, I want to show you a series of slides uh, that help depict 
how much obesity has grown over time. This is taken from the Centers for Disease Control, very reputable outfit, and it's from the Behavioral Risk Factor Survey. So for the scientists out there, the methodology didn't change. It's the exact same survey given out each year. If anything, these may be underestimates. Uh, Mike Huckabee, the guy who ran for president, governor of Arkansas, had an idea of having a BMI report card where all the kids would go home with the, with the report card. Parents didn't like it, but what they found was that the rates that the CDC were estimating were probably underestimates, which is disturbing. But let's take a look here at this slide looking at the rates of obesity. And you can see here that uh, as we go to dark blue, it's about 15 to 19% of that state is obese. And once we get to red, it means that greater than 20% of that state is obese. And let's see what happens here as we go along. Very quickly here, handful of years. So fast, almost like an infectious disease. Look here. Now finally we get to a new color. And that's the color here is gold. And that's for the state of Mississippi. I'm originally from Alabama. Our motto was thank God for Mississippi. Because otherwise, <laughs> otherwise we'd, be, we'd be last in everything good and first in everything bad. But unfortunately, Alabama joined it the next year. So not a long-lived uh, period of uh, prosperity for Alabama there. But as we keep moving along here, we keep getting bigger and bigger and new colors here. Now, the latest data look like things are leveling off. And I say thank goodness because we have not a lot more room to go here. And you can see here the latest data show that there are states that have more than a third of its population that are truly obese. You can see that summarized here in these slides. And as we've seen the rate of growth for adults, it's almost, it's exceeded by our rate of growth for our kids. Now I want to put up this one slide just to put it in context. Uh, we're going to talk about weight loss surgery and who qualifies, and it's basically a BMI over 40, so pretty high BMI. Um, and if you look here, the high, if we took everybody who qualified for weight loss surgery in this country and put them all into one state, that would be the state of OB city, and you can see that there. It's 12 million people. That would make it the seventh largest state in the United States. Sir, you had a question? Looks like it's some correlation to the internet. Like, you know, people talk about not to play or whatever. No doubt. The question is if there's correlation to the internet, and clearly sedentary activity contributes to this. Uh, some of my best customers actually work for uh, Google, um, work for Apple, because they're at the computer all the time, aren't they? don't get up, stretch around, need some caffeine to keep going. Uh, when they have something sweet, they want something salty, and it leads to impact. So clearly the internet has had a big role here, no question about it. Now, as uh, Dean mentioned earlier, if we keep going at the same rate, look at what's going to happen. By the year we get to about the year 2040 here, uh, we're going to have almost uh, half of the country is going to be obese, and 80% are going to be overweight. In fact, if we continue at the same rate of obesity, we may actually see for the first time in recorded medical history an actual decline in life expectancy. We're all raised on the premise that we're going to be, that the next generation is going to be better than the last. Well, that may not be the case when it comes to uh, our next generation if we keep up with these trends in obesity. So clearly something needs to be done. Because there's a toll to be paid, you see here there's cost associated with it. About $150 billion are spent each year. Fully 10 cents of every healthcare dollar is spent on obesity. If we had kept obesity rates at 1990 levels, we would have had more than enough money to pay for healthcare reform. So we've got another toll to pay here. Now I want to put it into context. We, we just had healthcare reform, so I, I started studying back up on the Constitution and what's involved in it. This is the executive branch of the White House. You can see here. Uh, let's talk about the different cabinet, uh, the treatment. So obviously health and human services are going to deal with this, and they're the ones that fund us. How about prevention? Well, this, if you can make out that seal, that's actually for agriculture. So a good place to start is clearly with our school lunches that that department has some impact with. Department of Education, we've got to get education uh, to incorporate physical activity. How about housing and urban development and transportation? The ability of people to go out and exercise on safe streets is important, and they have to have that ability. Shaded sidewalks, all those things make a difference. Department of Energy, I believe Dr. Robinson is going to talk to you about some interesting things there, that sometimes um, energy security may be met with food security. Think about that. We'll hear more about it. 
And then lastly, let's look at some of the effects. Department of Interior, what does that have to do with obesity? Well, a lot of our Native Americans are taken care of through the Department of the Interior, and they have an exceedingly high rate of obesity. We get Department of Justice and, and Labor, Anti-Discrimination Act uh, that impacts obesity and obese individuals. Also looking at the impact on, on job promotions, commerce, treasury. They will tell you very quickly, it has some impact on the bottom line. Uh, they found that uh, you know, there's a decrease in productivity. There's a decrease in also uh, days at work. So all of those things make a big difference. Department of State, what does the Department of State have anything to do with obesity? Well, China faces a diabetes epidemic. A lot of people have said that you know, this is going to be the Chinese century. Well, with the exportation we've had of Kentucky Fried Chicken and everything else to China, we may actually undermine some of that growth, at least from an economic sense. Now, I want to put up this last one because I think it's interesting. Homeland Security, the VA, Department of Defense, how, what role do they play with obesity? Well, a very big one. Uh, if you look here, actually some retired generals and admirals have come out uh, saying something needs to be done because the recruits are not fit enough to complete basic training. If people may recall, way back in the uh, late 1940s, school lunches were begun because when kids were, were young adults were entering the military, they didn't have uh, good enough nutrition, so they started it. Now we need, we're working almost backwards, so we've got to do something on that aspect too. One more toll to be paid, and that's the psychological aspect for these patients. No one wants to be heavy. Nobody wants to carry extra weight. And it has a toll on all those patients on a psychological aspect. Getting jobs, taking a look here at some so-so movies, Shallow Hal, The Clumps. We live in a pretty politically correct time and place where it's not okay to make fun of a lot of different people. But it still seems to be okay to make fun of people who carry extra weight. And it has impact. You can ask those patients, it has impact. It has impact on our ability to render care for those patients as well. They don't always get the care they need and deserve. And we're trying to educate our future physicians about this. There is a course that we teach here at Stanford where our medical students are part of it. Now, what can we do about this? I hope I've painted a pretty dismal picture about the impact of obesity and how prevalent it is. Does everybody agree something needs to be done? Yeah. Okay, let's see what we can do. Let's look about medicines, because that's usually where we start in the United States. In, in the interest of time, we, we, I don't have all the slides I usually discuss here, but one, one thing I put up there, are we medicating ourselves on the way to obesity? All the antidepressants have you gain weight. There's a lot of different medicines that will have you gain weight. Is medication going to be the answer? Not right now. If you look there, there's a long list of medications, and unfortunately, each of them have side effects, and each of their effect is modest at best. Um, unfortunately, right now, we don't have a medical cure for this in terms of medication. Uh, we have a target-rich environment, but we're precision poor. People may remember Fenfen, worked like a charm, had some bad effects on the heart, unfortunately. So we've got to figure out a better way of doing this, and I think eventually what it will be is going to be like a cocktail, much like we have for HIV, where we address each different pathway. What about plain old uh, dieting? This takes a look at the uh, effect of weight loss and your ability to hear, adhere to it. And if you look at it, um, everybody does pretty well as long as they stick to those diets. And it really doesn't matter if it's Atkins or Zone or Ornish, any of those are probably okay, because at the end of the day, it's your ability to stick to that diet that makes it uh, important. Unfortunately, most people do not stick to their diet. And we're talking about the morbidly obese, not the pleasantly plump. So what we're really looking at here are people whose BMI is over 40. Those people fail diet and exercise 95% of the time. Simply don't have good options for those patients at this time. Now why is that? Why is it that they can't lose weight? Are they not trying enough? Is it a lack of willpower in those patients' part? Moral failure? Are they doing something wrong? No. They're trying their hearts out. If you talk to these patients, and we do on a daily basis, and see them, they've all tried to lose weight. As I said earlier, no one wants to carry that extra weight. Part of the reason that we see some of the uh, patients regain weight after dieting is hormonal to some degree. I briefly mentioned that ghrelin, that hunger hormone, and if you take a look up here, ghrelin it corresponds to these peaks. And if you look here, this is breakfast, this is lunch, and this is dinner. The black dots are before you've lost weight, or after you've lost weight, and the white dots are before you've lost weight. 
So your body's not stupid. It, you, it knows that you've lost weight, and it's going to do everything in its power to regain that weight. So it pumps up the volume, if you will, with getting more of this ghrelin on board. So you may ask, well, where, what role does surgery play when it comes to some of this hunger hormone business? If you look down here, this is that same hunger hormone, way down here at the bottom, it goes to almost zero. So that's what makes the uh, surgery quite effective. It allows you to have a hunger holiday. People don't feel as hungry, and as a result, they can recreate their dietary lifestyle. Now, I'll start here to talk a little bit about surgery. We know this is a big problem. It's a public health issue. It's not one that's gonna go away uh, through surgery alone. And I think the one thing that surgery does, though, is focus attention on the issue, allow us to understand what's going on. And to a large degree, it's a lot like uh, what we've seen in other public health problems. Uh, things like in the past, we've seen cancer, uh, where we didn't have good treatments. Surgeons were there in the beginning. St. TB used to be a surgically treated disease. It's now treated through medicines, but surgery helped us to understand it. Same thing with heart disease, so I'm not surprised that surgery is there in the beginning, at least focusing attention on the issue. So talk about who qualifies for weight loss surgery. And it's really a BMI over 40 or a BMI over 35 with a serious medical problem. We wanna make sure that those patients are psychologically uh, well equipped to meet the challenge of weight loss surgery so they meet with the psychologist ahead of time. And we wanna make sure that they've tried to lose weight in other manner. Now what happens after surgery? This is a very short rendition of the huge changes that occur after surgery. You can see that there. I like to tell patients your changes are as simple as four by four. It's four small meals about four hours apart. Protein first, avoid foods high in sugar, high in fat. You want a water load. You want to drink a big glass of water before you eat. That makes you feel a little fuller and as a result you won't eat as much. The other things we recommend for patients, be really careful with liquids because you can gain weight with liquids and not be aware of it. And of course to take their vitamins on a daily basis. Now people often ask, can you regain weight you know, after the surgery? And the answer is yes, you know, if you don't follow the rules. But like anything else in life, if you follow the rules, things tend to work out for you. And if you look here, there are some reasons why people regain weight after weight loss surgery. One is grazing. It's kind of like how it sounds. You can't eat a whole lot after surgery because the stomach is so small. But if you nibble a little bit all day long, it catches up with you. And that's the grazing part. Simple way to address that, stick to your diet. Stick to your four meals, simple as four by four. Liquids I mentioned before, they're meant for hydration, not calories. Be very careful with that. Um, I like to go into different uh, uh, Starbucks and places like that to get their nutritional information. Take a look at one of those venti mochaccino latte gazillionamas or whatever they're called. And they're about 600 calories. It's almost like a Big Mac in a cup. So be very careful with liquids because there is not a mechanism to make you feel full afterwards. And think of simple things too. Uh, think of instead of having that latte that's 200 calories, have a cup of coffee, it's five calories. That simple exchange will really gain you in the end. An additional 150 calories a day will have you gain 10 pounds at the end of one year. Be careful with that everyday thing. That's the power of the everyday. The last point I'll make is nighttime eating. You really do want to confine that large meal towards the middle of the day, not right before you go to bed. You have no ability to burn off any of those calories, and it's a simple way of gaining weight. They call it the sumo wrestler diet. You have a few beers and go straight to bed. Uh, not what you want to do. So I always tell patients, most of my patients tend to be women, I tell my patients eat like a queen for breakfast, a princess for lunch, and a pauper for dinner. Simple to remember. Yes, ma'am. If that's from 94, is that, a, is that referring to gastric bypass or just referring to uh, general purpose weight loss? Well, it, I think this is mainly for surgical, you know, here, but all of those things hold true for diet, too, you know. Uh, High-calorie liquid foods are no-no. You don't want to have a big meal right before going to sleep, and you certainly don't want to snack. So all those things still hold you in good stead when it comes to dieting. So where is that hormone release from? Good question. Surgery controls it? Very good question. So the, the question is, how does, uh, where is that hunger hormone released and where is it? And if we look here at the different operations we provide, it's this part of the stomach. We call it the fundus. It's the very top of the stomach. If we somehow or another avoid this part of the stomach, good things happen when it comes to weight loss and to control of your uh, diabetes. 
So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the different procedures we have here at Stanford and then their effect on some of the weight aspects and some of those comorbidities. So I also want to show you the approach we've taken. It's almost an evolution, if you will, in surgery. This is kind of the traditional approach, the, the larger incision, what we call open. This is the laparoscopic approach, what was termed band-aid band surgery a few years ago, where we do everything through small incisions about this big. If the class would like to see it, I have a video at the end here if you'd like to see it. The other thing that we uh, do is also what we call single incision. So one very small incision that's actually tucked away in the belly button here. You can see here, we actually inserted a lap band that went in there. And finally, we have some new things where we're doing things actually just through the mouth. So no incisions at all, something we call no scar. And so that's something new that's coming down the horizon as well. So let me tell you a little bit about the different procedures. This is the lap band. People may have seen ads for it. You know, tame the tiger or the, uh, the lion. If you watch late night TV like I do, you can see that. And what happens with the lap band is a lot like putting a belt around the top of the stomach and we can cinch up that belt or loosen it as needed. There's a little balloon on the inside that we can inject with saline solution and make it tighter or looser. Very straightforward. This is a very low risk procedure. You don't get quite as much weight loss as with the bypass, but again, it's an option for patients. One of our newer procedures here is a sleeve gastrectomy, where we take the stomach, which is roughly about the size of a football, and make it into a long skinny tube, roughly about the size of a banana. You can see that there. The advantage of this, unlike the band that I mentioned right before, we don't have to do any of those adjustments. And unlike the bypass that you're going to see in a second here, we don't actually reroute anything. So it's a new procedure that's gaining some traction. And here is the bypass. By far the most common procedure we perform here at Stanford, about 70% of what we do. And you can see that um, it works on two levels. All the other ones were restrictive, if you will, made everything smaller, little stomach. This one's a little different in the sense that you do have a small stomach, which is roughly about the size of my thumb, very, very small. You can see that little stomach divided here. And then we take a portion of the intestine, divide it in half, and bring it up. And so between here and here, you don't absorb any calories. You need juices from this part of the intestine to start that digestive process. So it works on two levels. It's primarily restrictive, but it has that extra malabsorptive effect. Now what's really fueled the growth in this has been the laparoscopic approach, our ability to do it with the small incisions. A lot of the celebrities have had it, Carney Wilson, Al Roker, uh, Randy Jackson. And what's driven them to it is the fact it works, has excellent weight loss, there is potential for problems, particularly when it comes around vitamins. Patients have to take their vitamins on a daily basis. The other thing is there can be complications. You know, we do this uh, through little incisions, but it's a big operation. And we have to make sure that we can do this operation safely. And I'll talk to you very briefly here about some of the um, review criteria we do. And some of the review criteria comes around safety. Because anything we do in medicine has to be safe. First thing they teach us in med medical school is First, do no harm. First, do no harm. So when we take this on in some of our bigger patients who have a lot of medical problems, we want to make sure we're going to do it safely. My partner and I wrote this editorial where we reviewed some of the mortality data. And what we found was quite simple. We found that with the right patients in the right hands, we had excellent results. And those results were best engendered by doing it at places that do a lot of surgery. More volume, better outcomes. This is no surprise to anyone, I hope. You know, this is a lot like sports. You know, the more swings you have at the plate, the better baseball player you're going to be. And as a surgeon, the more I do, the better surgeon I become. I work with a team. We work closely together. We correct any sort of mistakes that may occur. And you can see the results behind me. We took all those different uh, hospitals in the United States, divided them into three aspects here. This is low volume, medium volume, and high volume. Again, this is a dose-dependent effect. As you do more cases, you get better outcomes. Same thing for mortality, that was for complications, but we saw the same thing for mortality. So what constitutes a high volume center is more than 125. At Stanford, we do over 250. Now we've also demonstrated this uh, in our um, Packard Hospital as well. We also do adolescent weight loss surgery, should mention that. And we've seen that we also perform the same sort of effect when it comes to volume in adolescent patients. This is our group, we're a center of excellence, and you can see there we perform the full complement of weight loss surgery. It's a team, everybody from plastic surgeons to dietitians, former patients are our nurses, 
And so we are very much in tune to taking care of the patient entire. These are results, and you can see here we've got pretty good results. We've had, we've performed over 2,000 cases in the last seven years with no operative mortality. You can see there that, again, when you do a lot of these cases, it can be quite safe. Now, what about its ability to work on those problems that we talked about at the beginning, the extra weight, the medical problems? This is a 10-year study, where, and you can see here it's from Sweden. And you can see here with the bypass, people lost about a third of their weight and kept it off at 10 years. With a band, about half that. The control patients, not so good. They stayed about the same. These are our own results here at Stanford. Oh, sorry, question? How many patients that come to you who are morbidly obese are not good <coughs> surgical candidates because of their obesity? So the question is how many patients come to see me that end up not being a candidate for surgery? Uh, we are lucky in the sense that the patients who come see us are already kind of self-selected to a large degree. So it's roughly about 10%. And most of the times when people don't have surgery have to do with psychological issues. Not because of their, like, comorbidities? Or no, comorbid yeah, that's a good question. So do comorbidities bar you from having the surgery? And the answer is no. In fact, that's the reason to have the surgery is when you have the diabetes and the high blood pressure and all the other things. So, so our, res our results replicate um, what you've seen, the 10-year uh, study from Sweden there. This, these are results from uh, Lucille Packard. Uh, the kids started out with a BMI of 55, so even higher than our adults. And now we go down to about a BMI of 32, still overweight, but certainly a big improvement. Um, Dr. Robinson's gonna talk a little bit more about the impact of weight with our kids. Now, what about diabetes, high blood pressure, all of those things? Well, look at this one slide here, and I wanna draw your attention to this one point here, and that's looking at the impact of the surgery on diabetes there's a resolution rate of about 82% at the end of one year. And that's without insulin, that's without metformin, that's without any medication. I'm not gonna call it a cure, I'll call it a remission, uh, because there's always that ability for people to regain the weight. But nevertheless, it's an amazing thing that we found. We're still trying to work out exactly why diabetes gets better so quickly. It gets better in about a week to two weeks time. It's really remarkable. It has a lot to do with that fundus we were talking about earlier. Yes, ma'am. Would that be type 1 and type 2? <laughs> That's a good question. So this is only for type 2. It does not work for type 1. So type 2 is where you are making insulin, but the body's resistant to it. And type 1 is where you don't make enough. So again, there are a lot of studies to support that finding with the resolution of diabetes. Now, what happens to people's um, survival? You know, we're all happy to see uh, getting rid of the diabetes and everything else, but what about its impact at the end of the day on survival? You know, we're happy to see an improvement in quality of life, but what about is there an impact on quantity of life? And if you look at this one study, again, from the Swedish Obese Subjects Trial, if you look here, this is the mortality rate, and you can see here the controls had considerably more than those who underwent surgery. I want to show it again in a different way. This is from uh, Utah. This, uh, this is from another study that showed the impact of, of weight loss surgery on causes of death. There was about a 40% reduction. That's what this translates to, that hazard ratio. Now, there was one place where there was an increase in mortality after surgery, and it was due to suicides and accidents. The one thing that may bind those two things together may be substance abuse. Uh, about 50% of traumas occur with, with alcohol on board and suicides are closely correlated with uh, sometimes substance abuse. So we did a study to kind of investigate this a little bit further, and all these studies I'm gonna show you were actually undertaken with our medical students here. We have a great program called Med Scholars that allows our students to do research, and it's been a terrific resource for everyone involved. But what we did is we took um, a group of patients and uh, recruited them to consume five ounces of red wine before surgery, and then after surgery. I didn't have any problem recruiting people for this study. <laughs> Filled up in a hurry. But if you can see here, we gave them five ounces of red wine, measured their breath alcohol level, and this is what we saw later. So you can see down here pre-op is that blue line, and as the blue line is there, now over time, the yellow line is six months. A single glass of red wine made them legally intoxicated. It has to do with how the alcohol is processed through the stomach. So this may account, perhaps, one way or another, uh, for why we see that increase in mortality for people undergoing gastric bypass surgery. 
And we warn patients about that now. We make sure that they don't uh, have too much to drink before and after surgery. Cost, of, cost effectiveness for the surgery, you can see that listed here. It's less than the 50,000 mark, which is kind of the mark we have for dialysis. Skip here, return of, an, of investment. Insurance companies want to make sure if they expend some money that they get that money back. Study has shown that you can get that money back within two years. Now I want to finish up here with telling you a little bit about some of our patients. There's a saying in medicine, the secret in caring for the patient is in caring for the patient. And you have to learn about the patient, listen to them, and learn from each and every one of them. So I'll tell you a couple of stories here that are exemplified by our patients. This is a former high school wrestling coach. Um, he had two open heart surgeries. He was on three different statin medicines to control his cholesterol and still was not well controlled. And so he came to see me to see if we could get that better for him. And what we, we did a study where we looked at the impact of weight loss surgery on some of those cardiac risk factors people may be familiar with when you go to the doctor. They take a look at your total cholesterol. With the surgery, it dropped by about 20 points. LDL, the bad cholesterol, dropped almost by a third. Try the uh, good cholesterol, HDL, went up by almost 20%. Triglycerides, something associated with diabetes, went down almost by half from 141 to 92. There are newer cardiac risk factors because we're always looking for better ways to tell you if someone's going to have a heart attack. Things like homocysteine, we saw a 20% reduction. I think you're getting uh, the, the tune here, very consistent results. Lipoprotein A went down more than half. C-reactive protein really went down, and that's probably the single best measure of heart disease risk in these patients, and it went down from 8.2 to 1.4. What about our adolescents? You can see one of our patients there. They also had big improvements. Can you imagine these kids having high cholesterol, high C-reactive protein, high fasting insulin, like here on this slide? Anything above 20 is considered abnormal, and these patients started out about 40. At the end of two years, it had normalized. So some pretty big impacts for those young adults as well. And you can see impacts here going across the board. And there he is about a year later. So I'll finish up with a couple of more stories here. This is an interesting patient, and uh, he's an interesting patient because he's a doctor. He's an endocrinologist. And he came to see me because he was having trouble with his blood sugars, but also having trouble with his testosterone. When you're a male and you carry extra weight, that testosterone sometimes goes down. And it goes down because it gets converted to estrogen. And when that happens, it can lead to some problems. Uh, it can be an independent cardiac risk factor. And the other thing we found is that uh, it can have impact on prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is higher in people who are, in men who are obese. So we did a study again to take a look and wanted to see if weight loss uh, made testosterone or PSA levels change. PSA is that marker for prostate cancer. This is what we found. You can see here the testosterone uh, went up. Here's the goal line, almost doubled. SBMI went down. People who were low testosterone went down from 60% to less than 10%. PSA actually went up. So one thing that we found from that PSA marker is that some of these cancer markers that we have for the obese may not be accurate uh, because the, the obese patient has a little more volume on board. And so all these things we do to test for them may need to be recalibrated, if you will. I'm going to finish up here with uh, one more study. Um, and this is dealing with a patient of mine who is a former diabetic whose mom actually had Alzheimer's. She was aware there's a connection, believe it or not, between Alzheimer's and diabetes and carrying extra weight. Here she is before and after. And the one thing we know as we get older, well, there's also an increased risk of having being obese. Combine those two things together, increased risk of dementia. So there have been some studies that have shown that your thinking, your ability to process things gets better as you control your diet, gets better as you control your diabetes. So you know where I'm going here. I want to see if the surgery improved the ability to think, remember, and process things. We looked at cognitive domains here, IQ, executive function, all these different things. We can take these tests together if you'd like. Here's our IQ test. You can remember that. Now this is something called the digit vigilance test. So every time you see the number six there, you've got to circle it as quickly and as cleanly as possible, something like this. This is an interesting test. It's the digit span. It's the, your ability to remember things. 
And you guys can see if you can remember this, 334. You can call it out if you'd like. Okay, 334288. Okay, 334288 Pretty good, pretty good. 334-288-0186-3967. You get the idea. So that's my old uh, home telephone number. So, so this shows you also uh, trail making. You want to connect all the numbers uh, without lifting up your pencil, so no errors here. And this is one of those tests, and it looks something like that. So what did we find at the end of the day? We found that patients lost weight. You can see the BMI went down nicely. We also saw that those cardiac risk factors and impact uh, potential for dementia also went down significantly. And we found that everywhere, except in two places, the obese patients did worse than norms, than the societal norms. And what we saw was improvement at the end of six months. And this is a summary of that study. I'm going to skip this just to finish up on the, this last slide here. Everybody knows the saying, the family that eats together stays together. This is husband and wife. I operated on them, as you can see there, uh, before surgery. Here they are about a year later. Wow. Notice anything else? Yeah. So remember that obesity and social contagion? Well, we want to work backwards. We want to see if having that weight loss actually makes a difference uh, for, these, uh, for, the, for these families. And we actually did a study where we looked at the obese family members. And what we saw is that the obese family members of the people who had surgery actually lost weight too. So we're trying to see if this will work backwards. The kids lost weight as well. It's not measured in, in uh, BMI. It's measured kind of on a growth chart. But even those obese kids uh, lost weight as well. So I'll close with that and saying that the family that eats together stays together. Thank you very much for your attention. And we can. Uh, would you like to see a video of a patient or a video of the procedure? Okay. If you want to see more, go to the website. Come visit Stanford Bariatric Hospital. So this is the procedure. You can see here. And I think we had a question in the, um, on the side here. There it goes. Question, sir? Well, I, I, so the question is, well, you know, surgery for this, it just seems awful extreme, and it should be not first resort but last resort. I agree with all that. You know, we have 12 million people in this country who qualify for weight loss surgery, and we do about 150,000 operations a year. That's less than one-half of 1%. So I don't think there's a widespread uh, ability to deliver a lot of the surgery, and it really should be last resort for patients. They should have tried other ways. Um, and I don't think, again, surgery is going to be the only answer. I have a public health degree. I think, you know, things like Dr. Robinson and others are doing, that's going to be the long-term solution. Right now, what I see this as is uh, someone's drowning, and I'm throwing them a lifeline. I don't wait to build a bridge. I'm going to do what I can to help one patient at a time. Uh, but I think what we can do in surgery is learn a lot from it. And the results are good, albeit it has to be at a place that has good outcomes. If you have bad outcomes, all those benefits are lost. So. It's very important we maintain high quality outcomes at, at these centers of excellence. So, yes, ma'am. You have uh, an extremely obese person, and once you start losing the weight, they have all that loose skin. Mm -hmm. how, how do they get back to like you? <laughs> well, I don't know if they're going to look as good as you, but um, so the question is what happens after you lose weight and you have all that loose skin? If you're a really large person and you lose a lot of weight, you are going to have loose skin. That's just a simple fact of life. Do we have reconstructive surgeons who can make that better? And to my mind, uh, this is reconstruction. It's not aesthetic, okay? It's for function, your ability to work out better. Um, it depends on how much weight you lose. There are a few things that help mitigate some of that loose skin. One thing, the younger you are, the less loose skin you're gonna have. The other thing is um, every woman in this audience will attest to, men have thicker skin than women, and uh, the thicker skin tends not to sag as much, so that helps out quite a bit too. Compression garments, 
but it, if you have massive weight loss, you're gonna have loose skin. But thankfully, we've got a great plastic surgery department here that can assist with that. Yes, ma'am. Is it considered elective surgery? It is absolutely an elective surgery. It's by no, I have never done an emergency gastric bypass. I can attest to that. Yes, sir. Yes. What about liposuction? Question is about liposuction. Liposuction does not work for weight loss, period. It will come back. We have a lot of really smart fat cells that will regenerate and fill up again. Uh, all it does is help out perhaps with some aesthetics. It has no impact in terms of any sort of uh, functional or health benefit. Strictly aesthetic. Liposuction is not for weight loss. Yes, ma'am. Can the skin be donated for burn victims? It can be. Uh, they have enough, I think, at this point here at Stanford, so it's not something we're doing currently. But can skin be donated? The answer is yes. Yes, ma'am. In watching this video, you're working in a ton of factors. Do you take a bunch of that out of the time? Uh, so that's a good question. All that fat that you see behind me there is something called the omenum. Um, and there have been studies, we actually did one where we took out the omenum to see if we got additional benefits. There was no additional benefit, so we just leave it in there. Just recedes with time. So, yes, ma'am. Um, is there an explanation for why fat redeposits in, or deposits in certain areas, mm -hmm. particularly over time? Mm -hmm. Why changes from going one place to another? <laughs> <laughs> So the question is about fat and where it likes to congregate. And uh, uh, there's basically two types of fat distributions. There's the apple and the pear. Uh, if you have your choice, always be a pear. Apple carries a lot more risk for, for heart disease. That's that visceral fat. Um, and people are different in terms of their genetic makeup as to where that fat can congregate. Um, not a whole lot you can do for it in terms of, uh, um, you know, ex well, you can do something about it in terms of keeping that weight lower. Uh, that always helps out. Uh, but everybody's predisposed to that. Uh, you do want to be careful of having that visceral fat. When I see a, a beer belly now, it's not funny to me. It looks like a time bomb ready to go off uh, because it's, there's some serious heart disease behind that. So, uh, yes, ma'am. So are you still doing a lot of liposuction still? Well, the, plastic, the question is about doing more liposuction. Plastic surgeons will do liposuction. Um, you know, I'm afraid to tell this joke. Should I tell the joke, Dean? I don't know. <laughs> it's clean, I promise. So the joke is, how do you hide money from plastic surgeons? You can't. So that's how we... It wasn't that good of a joke, anyway. So plastics... <laughs> so the question is, why is it being done? It's for aesthetics, so... It's not popular still for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, liposuction still being performed, but it... That's right. <laughs> you know. And like my my question always has been, how do you know what you're taking out of there? You might be taking some good stuff out of there. <laughs> well, that's a good question. You know, it's actually not as uh, it's not as um, there can be complications with it, and and really has no health benefit. It's strictly for aesthetics. So I want to be mindful of Dr. Robinson's time here um, and make sure he's got time. And we're both going to hang out after the uh, talk, so we'll, we'll take plenty more questions. I really appreciate everybody's attention. Thank you. How about if everybody stands up? <laughs> and that's not just to... There's actually a... a reason I asked you to do that, and one of it is not just to to make sure you're, you're uh, as awake as possible, but also because it turns out that just the act of standing up turns out to be good for you. <laughs> that it looks like just sitting uh, physiologically is a risk factor or a, a problem um, beyond you know, lack of exercise. So just sitting and the amount of time we spend sitting down uh, turns out to be a problem. So, some of you, if you want to continue standing and move to the back, that's OK. <laughs> but the rest of you, if you want, can sit down as long as you stand up again at the end. So there is a, I know people who never sit down, too, who, who go into meetings and stand up the whole time. Walking desks. OK, my, I, I think this is really nice because Dr. Morton and I come from very different perspectives in terms of addressing this problem, and yet we have a, a tremendous amount of agreement in terms of what, how we, 
how, uh, what we think about the problem and where we think we should go with it. And I don't think that's um, altogether common when you get surgeons and general pediatricians in the same, in the same room about this. Uh, but it is something that uh, I've, we've um, been talking about doing a lot of work together with, uh, with families in particular because, as you saw, um, obesity really does move in families. So I'm going to address this problem from the idea of prevention, which is where my focus is, and, uh, and in particular with kids. And you saw the definition of obesity in, in adults was a, or a, of overweight of 25 and obesity of 30, and then class 1, class 2, class 3. And um, in kids, we define it a little bit differently in that it's still based on the body mass index. And this is how you calculate your body mass index if you're, if you're interested. And in fact, if, you're, if you don't like uh, squaring numbers in denominators, you can just say weight divided by height divided by height again. That's the same thing as weight divided by height squared. So that's easy, and you can do that with any calculator. Um, you can get it online. Or you can get it online in many places. Um, but the, uh, we use body mass index in kids, but body mass index in kids tends to increase as they get older, normally. So normally growing kids have an increasing body mass index. So a body mass index of 25 or 30 isn't necessarily a good cutoff for kids because it needs to be adjusted for their age. So we use these growth charts. And they're similar to the growth charts that probably many of you have seen in your pediatrician's offices um, where we, we plot height and weight, but here we're plotting the BMI for age. And these uh, percentiles or these growth, this distribution of BMI in the population really comes from uh, all the studies that were done in children in the US that were directly measuring children um, from 1960 through about 1980. And that was determined to be the time when we had a normal weight population, or at least a good standard to start with. And so that's where we drew the percentiles. And so over the 85th percentile between 1960 and 1980 is, is now considered overweight. And over the 95th percentile is considered obese. And that's why now we can have more than 5% of the population over the 95th percentile, because we're thinking back and comparing it to what the population was like between 1960 and 1980. So we don't have the, the fancy uh, the map slides for kids, but we do have similar data, not by state, but for the nation as a whole and by age group. And what we can see in that is we've seen an even more dramatic increase in over <coughs> obesity in children than we have in adults. And this is what you saw. Remember what I just said is we, we looked at our, our the standard is between 1960 and 1980. And so you can see this is the percent of kids over the 95th percentile during those years during those surveys. So of course, it's the 5% or approximately 5% were above the 95th percentile. Look what happened within a decade after that. By the end of the 80s, you saw in school age kids and teens a doubling to over 10%. By the end of the 90s, a tripling in the percentage of kids over the 95th percentile. And then that has continued to the most recent data, which show um, some people uh, have argued that this shows a slowing and a little bit of a plateau, but it still seems to be um, going up, if, if not, or if plateauing or maybe going up a little bit um, in, in terms of the end of this decade or this past decade. And um, at this point, our hope is that it is plateauing and that we're not seeing it go any further. However, it's still is a terrible situation if we have three times or more of the percentage of the population that is over this 95th percentile, over the level that only 5% was uh, in 1980. Um, the other thing that's happened is that we've seen a change in, in how obese, obese children are, and the population is. Now, some of you probably remember this, Lord of the Flies, and this was the movie in 1963, and the guy on the left there is um, Piggy, and this is what an overweight kid looked like in 1963. Well, this is what an overweight kid looks like in 2010. And this is not unusual to, to see. This is a particularly graphic picture with him sitting at McDonald's with his large uh, Super Coke in front of him. But, um, but it's not unusual to see kids like this show up in our clinic. Now, this kid is probably um, only about four or five years of age. They tend to look older than their age when they're overweight, especially when they're this heavy, and they get very large. Um, 
And so this is what we're starting to deal with in our population, something that we as pediatricians never saw before, kids who were really this big. The other thing, as Dr. Morton suggested, it's, it's become a, a worldwide epidemic. And this is a quote from the Vice Minister of Health from the um, People's Republic of China that, and this is now a few years ago, that 20% um, of the children in urban, uh, in the cities in China, are already overweight or obese. And in fact, I think it was, it was noted in one of those studies, or, or Dean Piso may have mentioned it, that right now the latest data are in the urban areas in China, more than 10% of adults have diabetes. Now this has gone from almost nothing a couple decades ago to something that's of epidemic proportion now in China. And a lot of it is, is going along with the changes that have occurred in China. We're seeing the same type of thing occur in India. And one of the major issues we deal with is that, it, particularly in Asians and South Asian populations, is you don't have to be as heavy to have the complications of obesity um, to suffer from those. So we're starting to see in Korea and in China and India much higher levels of diabetes, for example, even though their populations aren't as heavy as ours. So they're starting to get it at a lower weight than we do. Um, Again, in, in kids, we see this as well in the population. And this is combined data from two of our studies in 7 to 10-year-old girls. These are normal school girls from South San Francisco and Daly City and Oakland. So about half of them are African American from Oakland, half of them mixed ethnicity from South San Francisco and Daly City. And what we see is between 15 and 20 percent already of normal school girls have an elevated total cholesterol and, H and LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol. Um, about 10% have high triglycerides, another type of fat carried in the body that's a risk for heart disease and stroke. And um, between 5 and 10% have prediabetes or an elevated insulin level. Um, this was, again, not selected girls who were overweight. This is just normal girls from a normal public school population. So we're starting to see these risk factors increase across the entire population as our whole population gets larger and heavier. Uh, Dr. Morton went through a number of these, but I'll go through quickly and point out a few. The comorbidities and complications really affect every, um, every part of the body and every organ system. In particular, type 2 diabetes, as you've heard about, is a, a major risk. The CDC's current projection is that for children born around year, year 2000, that one in three of them will have diabetes in their lifetime. So think of the implications of that when one of three of our one, one in three members of our population has diabetes. If you're an African American or a, a um, Latina girl, your risk is one in two. And that's assuming no further increases in the population obesity. That's just considering our current rates right now. Um, another problem that we see that it's almost unheard of before in kids was non alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that's a problem where fat infiltrates the liver. We see it in about almost 10% of the children we see in our weight clinic. Um, one of the problems with this is that over time, it can mimic um, alcohol in causing cirrhosis, and in fact can cause an, uh, cirrhosis that's indistinguishable from alcoholic cirrhosis. And some people are estimating this is going to be the number one cause of liver transplants, or reason for liver transplants in the future, because it's really, um, uh, it's, it's such a drastic problem. It's something that we really never heard about in pediatrics um, 10 years ago or rarely heard about. Um, central nervous system, orthopedic problems, reproductive complications, including a higher risk of, um, of congenital anomalies or birth defects. Uh, this is one erectile dysfunction that we thought was going to be very successful for public health messages. Unfortunately, we didn't see a lot of men losing weight as a result of this. Um, skin problems, psychiatric problems, cancer. Um, most cancer. Uh, epidemiologists are predicting that obesity is going to be the number one cause of cancer in the future. It's already um, considered uh, to be the cause of more than 100,000 cases per year in the U.S. and is associated with all these types of cancer. Uh, more surgical complications, premature death, stigmatization and prejudice, with Dr. Morton suggested, as well as the societal and economic costs, which are just extreme. Um, you also saw this too. This was just recent. Came out. Um, a study that was actually done back in November of the, about a third of people um, trying to get into the military are considered unfit, most of them because of obesity. So it really is a national security issue as well. Um, this is one of my favorite paintings um, above of uh, sort of obese families. And this is Botero, who tends to, to uh, paint these chubby families. 
And uh, why I like it is because it shows um, really the whole story in terms of obesity and the causes. In particular, it shows that obesity really does travel in families. And some of that is because uh, those families uh, really share a lot of their genetic background or their hereditary background. So they're carrying the same genes, which puts them at risk for gaining weight. Um, in addition, though, they also say, share the same environment. And so there's that environment and those behaviors that they model for each other that is also puts them at risk. And what I like about this is not only does it show the family, but it shows the pet dog there on the lower left. <laughs> And you notice that the dog is also obese. <laughs> and in fact, studies show that people's pets' weights are correlated with their own weights. And so in fact, um, that's another sign where presumably uh, the dog does not share the same genes as the, as the rest of the family, <laughs> but they do share the same environment that shows you that a change in the environment really does impact uh, weight. Another example of this, and this is from a study of, of uh, obesity rates by zip codes in King County uh, Washington in Seattle area. And what you can see is these different colors represent different, different darknesses, different rates of obesity in different zip codes. Well, um, it's really amazing how much heterogeneity is even in adjacent zip codes is that you can see large differences of, of two to two and a half times the prevalence just going from one zip code to the next. A lot of this is Actually, the, the best correlate of this is if for these zip codes of the obesity rates is the median home price. And that's where socioeconomic class comes in. But it also suggests, too, that there's a lot going on here that can't be explained purely by the biology. Because it's certain that not all the people with you know, a leptin deficiency or a, a problem with their genes moved from one zip code to the next, just to be there. They don't all migrate in the same way. And we see this difference across um, states. We see it across countries. And so a lot of the things we can try to modify um, go to, towards what we can do in the environment that causes these problems um, that then uh, sort of makes the genes express themselves, makes, makes our propensity to gain weight and our thrifty genes, if you want to call them that, makes them want to gain weight over time and, and, puts the, the, uh, and creates this obesity epidemic that we have. That's where a lot of our focus is going in terms of prevention and uh, intervening because we see that um, if we can focus on those things, it's a lot easier than trying to necessarily change the genes or even trying to provide uh, pharmaceutical treatments that uh, try and affect how the genes or physiology is functioning. So what are some of the main causes that we focus on? And I'm going to go through a number of different causes of obesity that lend themselves to things you can do or things we can do as a society to try and prevent it. One thing is dietary variety. How many... Uh, get you to, to guess, what do you think the, the just you can just yell it out, how many new products do you think are introduced into supermarkets every year? Every year? 1,000, 5,000, 20,000. Actually, you're the closest. It's 19,000 were introduced last year into supermarkets. Our food industry is extremely effective at being able to create new products and get them out there. Now, most of them don't last more than a year on the shelves. But there's constant change. It turns out that dietary variety is one of those things that increases intake. So even for the same amount of hunger, the more variety you have, the more you'll take in. Now, has anyone noticed this when you've eaten in a buffet, for example? When you go through how much more you put on your plate walking through a buffet line than otherwise? Well, that's part of this phenomenon. It turns out that it's not just how much you put on your plate, but the more different tastes, the more different colors, the more different uh, textures that you consume, the more you will consume and the more calories. So you can study this in the lab um, very easily and show that people will take in more calories and more consume more just by having more variety in their meals. So anybody, if you, if you think backwards why maybe the grapefruit diet worked for you at some point or the, or in fact this is one of the explanations for why Atkins diet seems to be effective. One of the possible explanations is that once you've cut carbohydrates out of your diet, you've erased about half of the potential foods that you eat. Well, you get bored or you eat less of the foods that are left because there's much less variety. And so that's one possible explanation. How mm -hmm. can we stop the um, food industry from creating all this extra variety, especially <laughs> foods, so-called foods that have corn syrup and other yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a very good question. And we, oh, sorry, the question was, how can we stop the food industry from creating this huge amount of variety, and particularly with, with ingredients like high fructose corn syrup and, and other, um, and sweetened, 
and lots of sweeteners. And um, the, I, I would say that, you know, I would, uh, I guess, sort of copy uh, Michael Pollan and say that, that you vote with your fork and that, that you get to make the way, best way to influence the food industry is by not buying the products or buying the products you encourage. Other than that, I don't think that there's a lot of, that we're going to do to change the amount of innovation. Innovation is, I think, a, a good thing because we see it going in other ways, too, and the food industry is starting to move towards more healthful foods. Mm -hmm. You talked about genetics being the cause of this, but yet there's so much focus on the change in the types of food that are available. So which is it? Is it how, what's the interplay between those two? Sure. Well, the, the, genetics, um, the genetics are there, and, and, and we're stuck with them at this point. And the genetics didn't change at all over the past 30 years, which led to this, uh, this epidemic. What has changed has been the environment we live in and our behaviors or society. So in terms of trying to reverse it, um, my focus is strictly on the, is, is on the environment and changing behaviors. Um, there are people focusing on trying to change the way the genes are expressed, maybe making them more resistant, the way our, making our bodies more resistant to uh, these environmental factors. But I believe that this is, that, that overwhelmingly the effect has been one of the environment, something we see with the spread of the uh, epidemic across the world as well. China and India didn't have a problem until they started to modernize, of course, and adopt our ways. And there's some very good studies demonstrating a lot of that was, for example, as populations uh, immigrate from one culture to another or move from rural areas to urban areas. But, mm-hmm. Question about genetically altered foods and especially hormone injections in chickens and other uh, cattle and whatnot. Uh, has there been any science done on whether the hormonal impact upon the animals that we consume is having an effect upon our physiology? <laughs> You know, there, there are people who believe that and have, have provided some more indirect evidence of that, but there's really not a lot of direct evidence that hormones, particularly bovine um, growth hormone is the one that you hear the most about, uh, that that has any impact on, on growth necessarily or on the obesity epidemic. However, you know, a lot of things have occurred at once, and I'm going to go through a lot of these sort of environmental factors that I think are things that we can pot potentially change most easily and that probably contribute the most. Um, but there are many other things, probably thousands of things you could come up with that have changed at the same time that we don't know what role they may have played in this epidemic. Okay, so dietary variety. Another one uh, is portion size. How many French fries do you think there are in a single United States Department of Agriculture portion? 32. <laughs> Any other guesses? 15, 20? Actually, 15 is the closest. It's actually about a dozen. That's what you can see on this slide is that's the USDA approved portion size of French fries. Next to medium, large, and super size. Yeah, this is a, this is a. Yeah, now there are no longer any super size, but I haven't, we haven't gone and checked this to see what is in a large now, because I think what they did is just move the sizes up. But you see large sizes. And what we learned is that actually it's not just, again, the dietary variety, but the amount of food on your plate impacts how much you eat. And again, this can be demonstrated in the laboratory very easy, easily. You give people a larger portion and they will consume more regardless of how hunger they, hungry they are at the start. And so the larger the portions, the more you will eat. The other thing that's interesting is it's not just how large the portions are, it's how large you perceive the portions to be. And so, in fact, if you get all these, this supersized portion on a larger plate, it'll look smaller. <laughs> and in fact, you can manipulate the way that how much you eat just by changing your plate size. Yeah. And so food, so in general, there's a lot of suggestions to eat with smaller size plates, and we just are about to receive a, a, a large NIH award to study that in, in which families will be randomized where uh, to both family, all families will go through our regular uh, weight control program, and half of them will be randomized for us to go into their home and buy them all new plates and dishes and bowls <laughs> and glasses. Um, <laughs> Uh, to see if that, in fact, just changing that environment in the home uh, will help them uh, reduce their weight. The other part of this uh, is that it's being promoted, these larger serving sizes, is that now it, there seems to be a competition, and I don't know, those of you who watch any TV can't miss the ads from fast food joints really equating the size of the hamburger to your manlyhood in particular. Um, and in fact, I don't know if anyone's seen the recent Friday's ad that was on a lot of 
during the Olympics where, I think it was the Olympics, where they have a bunch of guys sitting around and one guy says, I'm going to have the 550 calorie entree, and they all laugh at him like, you know, <laughs> wimpy girl, you know, why are you having the 550 calorie entree? Because it's actually a threat to your manhood if, you, if you're trying to eat fewer calories. And I think that's a real problem how this is, is really promoted. But some of these meals, and this doesn't include the Coke or the French fries, right? 1,420 calories is almost an entire day's you know, requirement for calories for some of us. And so um, that's just this one example of how our servings are getting larger and larger. And if you eat outside the home in particular, you are losing control of how much you're eating because the servings are getting larger. Also, you lose the, the, um, the control of the content of what you're cooking with. Tom, I think this is true, but isn't it, wasn't one of the provisions in the health care reform bill that restaurants are now going to have to post um, the cal caloric amounts and servings? Right, that's what one of... Eats, you know, you'll be able to know <laughs> what your latte is or what your scone is. And... Yeah, that was sort of a surprise and a nice surprise. That? Oh, sorry, the question from uh, Dean Pizzo was uh, that, that in terms of this wasn't part of the health care reform bill, um, that we would have to, that restaurants would have to post um, calorie counts. And, uh, and in fact, the, the way that the, the, the uh, reform came through, it was that restaurants that I think have over 20 or 25 different um, uh, outlets over this, with the same name are going to be required to post their calorie content of all of their foods on their menu. And that was something, believe it or not, that was actually came to the White House. The White House didn't intend on including that in the health care bill. That, that was the suggestion of the restaurant associations. And it was the, the, their request because they wanted to include a preemption clause in it in which it preempts more difficult or more stringent rules in the states or in local areas. So we think it's a good thing, and it's a major move, and we think a lot of the advocates who focus on this believe that it is a, a step in the right direction and sets a good example. But it also has another side to it is that that the industries have learned from tobacco in particular that the easiest way to fight some of this is at the federal level instead of having to fight it at the local and state levels. Um, and a lot of that is because they can put in these preemption clauses. But that is, that's, we do believe that is a, a move in the right direction. Most of us do. Uh, another serving size issues come with uh, sweetened beverages, in particular sodas, is that now it's very tough to find less than a 20 ounce serving of soda in a, in a vending machine um, or in, a, in an outlet. And in fact, this is a picture of me uh, outside of a, uh, we stopped for a crab roll um, in Maine on the way to give a lecture in Maine and we're able to get these nice 64 ounce Cokes. <laughs> now, the best part of this was they came with free refills. So think about portion size. Now, now, Dr. Morton talked about the problem with liquid calories and, and particular sodas, but there's a particular issue with these that, um, that a lot of people aren't aware of well, when, they, when they're drinking these sweetened beverages, and that, is, and that counts for Gatorade and really any of these sweetened beverages, is that um, liquid calories aren't really um, dealt with the same as solid calories by the body. So if you eat a solid meal or a meal that has protein and fat in it, in particular, uh, then, then your body will eat a little less at the next meal. You'll accommodate for it because you'll be a little more full when you get to the next meal. Turns out with liquid calories, uh, except for things like milk that have protein in them, but liquid calories, uh, your body doesn't compensate for that. And so these are all just extra calories that you're consuming and why so many of us are, are concerned about liquid calories, especially in kids, because they're consuming so many soft drinks, so many sports drinks, so many of these really wasted calories because your body isn't going to respond to them or isn't going to compensate to them. Another thing is that in addition to creating very tasty food and, um, and uh, putting it in very large sizes and so you'll consume more, is we also, also price it less. And in fact, what's happened over time is because of issues like the way we subsidize food production in this country, um, and particularly corn, is you've ended up with lots of uh, high fructose corn syrup, very cheap corn sweeteners, as well as fats from soy oil. Um, and so, which are two of the commodity crops which are supported for the way we, we support farmers. Um, and so what you've seen over time is that real, the real price of the foods you don't want people to eat, like sodas and fats and oils and sugars and sweets and meats, 
tend to go down in price. And so we've seen a reduction in the real price of those things. While the real price of fruits and vegetables and full grains uh, and, uh, tends to go up, uh, has gone up over time uh, in comparison. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that there are socioeconomic gradients in terms of obesity and weight if when, uh, when what we're doing is pricing food in a way that encourages people, especially are in limited incomes or have a limited amount of resources, to eat the most unhealthful foods. So, so we price it low, we make it highly available, we make it taste good, and we market it to you. So not only uh, is it taste good and all that, but we want you to eat it. So we push it on you. Over $6 billion a year is spent marketing uh, food in this country. McDonald's alone spends more than $1.7 billion a year uh, just on advertising. That doesn't include any of the toys or any of the marketing that goes beyond advertising. That's just advertising, mostly television. Um, to put that in, in perspective, $1.7 billion is about the entire budget of the Food and Drug Administration. And that's just one fast food restaurant. Um, along with that, they're targeting, they're very good at targeting us. Um, you, some of you may have seen opportunities to sign a petition to get McDonald's to get rid of uh, Ronald McDonald, just like there was pressure to get rid of Joe Camel, because really his only reason for being there is to sell their product to children. Um, and so, really, he's, 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 uh, he's filling the same function. Um, here's an ad that was, was taken off after enough complaints. It says, where will she have her first French fry? It shows pictures of an infant that looks almost like, for sure, a premature infant with a, such small around the parent's uh, finger, around an adult's finger, and, and really you know, implants that image that French fries are, are a, a food that really promotes love and, and caring and those things. This came out in... in um, a parents magazine, and of course, French fries are not part of the recommended diet for infants. Same with soda. Here's another one that, that goes to branding. And in fact, it's not just some people think these are kind of cute, that your kid can drink out of a soda bottle that's branded, um, or a milk bottle that's branded, but actually, there is a sizable proportion of kids under one who are being uh, given soft drinks to consume. And, uh, and this is a real problem, and again, gets that branding going and gets that, that moving. We were interested in the concept of branding, um, and we did a study that uh, directly focused on that, particularly McDonald's or fast food branding, in which we had um, 63 children from uh, Head Start. So they were three to five-year-olds, uh, mostly low income or all low income, in Head Start programs in San Mateo County. And we gave them paired food tastings in which they got two of the same food uh, in front of them. One uh, was wrapped in a McDonald's, or on top of a McDonald's wrapper, and one on a plain wrapper that was the same color, the same texture, same, same uh, everything except didn't have the golden arches on it. We didn't use the Happy Meal, you know, fun wrappers. We just used the plain wrappers. And uh, we did this where we alternated, the, or we, uh, we randomized the order of the food, and we randomized what food they were getting and what in a, and went on which side, and we had a person behind a screen who couldn't see any of this who said, okay, first take a bite of this food, okay, now take a bite of this food, one side then the other. Now tell me, do they taste the same, which should have been the right answer because they were the same food. In fact, they would have come from the same hamburger or the same packet of nuggets, um, or point to one if it tastes better. And as you can see here from the yellow bars is the gray bar is the uh, percent of kids who said that the one on the plain wrapper tasted better. The red bar in the middle is the one that said they tasted the same or, or didn't answer. And with three to five-year-olds, quite a few kids can't answer. Um, and with the, the yellow bar is the percentage of kids who said that they thought the one that they thought was from McDonald's tasted better. So just the perception of a food, even if it's milk in a cup or apple juice in a cup, or if it's baby carrots, you know, the little carrots, if they think they're from McDonald's, then they think that they actually tasted better. So it's not that they want them more. It's just that they actually tasted different to them. And so we saw even in these young children, there was an effect of the branding on their perception of taste. Um, the other interesting finding from this was that over 70% of, of the parents reported that these, they had a toy from McDonald's in their home. So think about, if you're a marketer, think about that penetration. 70% of families with these low-income families uh, had a toy from McDonald's in their home. Pretty amazing. So, no one should be surprised. Some of you may have seen this floating around the internet. 
but in fact, we've created an environment which makes it almost impossible to maintain our weight. And so, you know, it's, it's especially if you're low income or have, uh, have limited resources or you live in a place like, for example, East Palo Alto, which until recently didn't have a supermarket, or West Oakland, which still doesn't have a supermarket. And, and in fact, the only place you can get your, uh, your, your food, unless you're willing to go to Berkeley or East Oakland, the only place you can get your food are liquor stores, of which there are plenty around, then, uh, then you end up in a situation in which you can't possibly depend on just your willpower or just your luck not to gain weight. So we really have engineered an environment which makes a food environment which makes it very difficult. So another issue is screen time in obesity. And this is one that we've studied quite a bit. And there are three reasons why we link screen time to obesity. One is it displaces physical activity. Actually, four reasons that I was reminded when, when uh, Dr. Morton spoke. One, displacing physical activity. Second, increased eating while viewing. And in fact, uh, in our studies, we find that about a quarter to a third of young children's calories are consumed in front of a screen now. And that is across different socioeconomic groups uh, and different uh, ethnic groups. Um, effects of advertising as well, uh, in that, as I showed you, advertising does have an impact on kids' uh, eating. And in fact, that's where a lot of the kids are getting their advertising. Even though you may think that your children and grandchildren are spending much more time on the computer, it turns out that really the, the main media uh, for most children, the main screen exposure for most children in the US is still the television. The other thing that's happened is that the food industry in particular has done a tremendous amount of advertising on the internet. If you aren't careful, your kids are going to these, um, these games that have either a product placement in them or advertising built in them, or McDonald's and all these companies, Coke, Pepsi, all have games for kids in which they register and they earn points and earn prizes that, in which they're promoting the brand as well. The fourth reason that Dr. Morton uh, reminded me of was sleep in that there's now about a dozen studies showing that children with TVs in their bedrooms or children who watch more TV have, uh, get less sleep. And in fact, we know that less sleep is associated with more weight gain prospectively. So in studying this, the approach we've taken to this is to, to try and reduce children's television viewing and seeing if we can prevent weight gain over time. And in fact, we've done that now in several studies. Um, I'm going to show you data um, from one of them that's uh, that, that displays this pretty well. Here, what you see is, is a red bar, which is from one school that received a curriculum. And all the third and fourth graders received a curriculum to help them reduce television, video game, uh, v, v, uh, video game DVD, and, uh, and computer use. And another school that just was measured at the beginning and end of the school year at the same time, but didn't receive any curriculum. And that's the blue bar. And over time, what you see is by the reports of the children and the um, is that they reduced their television, video tape, and video game use by about eight to nine hours more um, over the course of the school year. That was a reduction of about a quarter to a third uh, relative to the, the control group and the amount of, uh, they reduced their television viewing time. Well, that could just be them telling us that they watch less TV because they knew they were supposed to watch this TV. Mm -hmm. So we also, of course, did measurements of them. And we see that children in the treatment group gained about half, of, half as much weight in terms of their BMI as children in the control group. Um, now, as you remember from that first slide I showed you in terms of the growth charts, that children are expected to increase their weight over time um, because uh, as they grow. So we didn't expect this to go to zero. We expected them to continue to gain weight, but they gained at a much lower rate than children in the control group. Uh, another reason why it's important to always do controlled trials as opposed to just looking at what happens in group, especially in children, because things are changing over time. Uh, similarly, for waist circumference, about half as much of an increase. And this amounted to nearly an inch difference in their waist size over the course of only seven months. So a pretty, um, uh, pretty uh, large magnitude effect with an intervention that only focused on television viewing uh, on screen time and not on physical activity or diet at all. We didn't mention those at all as part of this curriculum. This was just focused on screen time. Um, going the other direction from uh, Dr. Morton's story is we also saw that even doing a curriculum with children in the school translated to effects on the parents at home and other siblings in the home. And what you can see here is the reduction in television viewing. We didn't ask about uh, VCR and video games in the parents and other siblings. So this is just television viewing, which is why the numbers are less. But you see that um, 
that in addition to the children who received the curriculum reducing their television time, you saw reductions in the mothers, the fathers, and the other children in the household as well. So here's an example of where the contagion worked from the child to the rest of the family. And something we see in a lot of our studies in which we focus on children and we find one of the best ways to get adults to change their behavior is get the kids excited about it. Because you know, parents have enough on their mind and enough things to worry about than to have to do something like reduce their children's television viewing. If you can get kids excited about watching less television, then they will get the parents involved in it and they'll bring the parents in on it as well. How about physical activity? <laughs> This looks familiar to anybody? This, is this in anybody's neighborhood? How about this one? It's another one of my favorites. Part of this is we build communities with no sidewalks or we place escalators and elevators in places that make them very easy to use so that, of course, you're going to use them. They're, they're right there in front of you. So again, it's not a matter necessarily of willpower, but the way we design our communities. This is an example from a community in Florida. And this is a, a simulation of what you could do that comes from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in which you can redesign a neighborhood to make it more walkable or make it more likely that you'll be physically active. So this is where you start. It doesn't look very appealing. Okay? You can add some shade, some traffic calming, so, so some crosswalks so the cars slow down, have to go around the circle. Um, uh, add some sidewalks in there that didn't exist before. Um, in California, you would have bike lanes there um, as well to make it easier. What about add some shade trees, make it even more uh, easier to walk and ride your bike. And in fact, we have to think about doing these types of things in our neighborhoods and in our environments to try and change our behavior as opposed to thinking about it all has to be, do we have to go to the gym? Do we have to do whatever it is that, that we do to keep our physical activity? Can we build physical activity back into our lives by designing our neighborhoods in ways that make it uh, easier to do so. Anybody recognize what this is? This is an endangered species. This is called walking to school. <laughs> In fact, this picture is from Australia. <laughs> and you don't have to go to Australia to do this, to, to find kids walking to school, but this is also something called a walking school bus. Has anybody heard of a walking school bus? Yeah. Okay, a few people. Well, walking school bus is where you create a school bus route, like a regular school bus, but instead of having a school bus pick the kids up, a parent or another adult walks the kids or several adults from house to house on a schedule just like the school bus, picks them up and walks them to school. So it addresses parents' concerns of fear and kids being unsupervised and safety. If you carry a wagon with you, you can put their backpacks in it so they don't have to carry their 40-pound backpacks to school. Um, and so you're trying to get at what are all the barriers that parents really uh, identify is why they are willing to drive to school, sit in line for a half hour with the engine running, waiting to get in to drop their kids off. I'm sure none of you have ever seen that. But um, this is an alternative, and it's something that has taken a root in some places better than others. There are a few of them that have occurred. Uh, Marin County, in fact, is one of the places that, the, that this has really been pioneered in and more than anywhere else. We did a quick study of this with one of our uh, postdocs where we used just a dozen kids uh, half of them randomized to do a walking school bus and half of them you know, took their normal routes to school. And we found just over a week that we could increase uh, their moderate to vigorous physical activity by 30 minutes, minutes a day just by doing the walking school bus. And, uh, and it wasn't compensated by doing any less activity during the rest of the day, which is something we always worry about. If you exercise more in the beginning, are they going to just go home and feel so tired at the end of the day? So in fact, it's a very easy way to increase physical activity in kids. Um, so this goes to one of the issues that, that we study and we really focus on in, in my work, and that is motivation, uh, motivation to change behavior. And there are really two types of motivation that we think about in designing our programs. One is the motivation to adopt the new behavior or the outcome. So that's the type of motivation that is, I want to I lose weight uh, or I want to do this, I want to be more physically active because I want to lose weight or I want to... Uh, not get diabetes, or I want to improve my cholesterol level, things like that, or I want to be more fit. Um, but that's something that, that doesn't tend to work on its own. So one of the things we focus on is we call motivation to participate in the intervention itself or process motivation or motivation in the process of behavior change. So in that case, we try and make the process of behavior change something that is motivating. Now, when um, we look at examples of these motivators, the traditional medical or public health model is to focus on the outcome motivations, 
to say you need to lose weight because you're going to get diabetes, you're going to get high, high cholesterol, you're going to die of heart disease, uh, you're going to die of cancer. But in terms of what we know from research on intrinsic motivation in particular, motivation and what really leads us to change our behavior and persistent new behaviors, it turns out to be these things in children but also in adults. Fun and taste, of course, but also choice and control, providing some perception that you have some choice in your activity or some control. Um, just having a choice between two things. And those of you who are parents or grandparents know that this works very well in terms of kids and also works in terms of adults and now has become a major tenet of, uh, of behavioral economics. Is now A lot of people are studying these in behavioral economics. Is that just providing a choice between two acceptable alternatives. So you can, uh, it's time to go to bed. You, you need to brush your teeth and put on your pajamas if that's your two choices, of acceptable choices. Well, just telling them, I want you to brush your teeth and put in your pajamas is going to be much less effective than say, you need to do those two things. You get to choose uh, which one you want to do first. Something as simple that you haven't changed the behaviors you want them to do at all. You've just changed the way you framed it as a choice as opposed to something that is imposed, imposed upon them. Um, goals and challenge. Goals are particularly uh, motivating and challenge. If you've seen uh, uh, any of you, actually the, the majority or the, the largest proportion of the population that plays video games are, are adult men. So I assume there's some video game players in here. But uh, for people who play video games, and we borrow a lot of what we do from video games because they work so well at getting people to do very mundane or routine things over and over again, is, uh, is, is the graphics really aren't that cool. They're pretty kind of, they're kind of lame actually. If you, look, if you really look closely at the graphics, the action and the plots are nothing. And so what is it that keeps people playing the same games over and over and over again? Well, they're trying to better their score. They're trying to get to level two. They're getting to level two is contingent upon getting through level one. These are the types of things by just framing it in these ways, you can increase the amount of challenge and make it highly motivating and have people set goals, beating their last score. Pride and sense of accomplishment, peer and social approval or disapproval, parent or adult approval or disapproval, very powerful motivator. Personal appearance, um, although we want to avoid going the opposite direction, and it, um, although our, our data suggests that providing uh, helpful ways to promote uh, weight control in kids actually reduces risk for eating disorders. Um, and social interaction, and a lot of what you see in terms of the Facebook phenomenon or, or Farmville. Has anyone here played Farmville, or is this... Anyone here heard of Farmville, probably? Yeah, there's something like, I don't know, some outrageous, like 90 million people are playing Farmville in this country. It's something, it's a crazy, it's a, it's a crazy statistic. It's a crazy game, and it's, it's, there's really not that much to it, but it's on Facebook, and, um, and, it's, uh, <laughs> and part of it is it's, it's social interaction. So we're doing a lot of work with social media now in our own work and trying to get at teens and even younger children and, and young adults um, in terms of social interaction turns out to be highly motivating and will keep you doing things and actually even spending money in the case of games like Farmville that, uh, that otherwise you would think people wouldn't do. So um, when I think about what those motivators are and they're not really focused on health, I, I ask the question, does a health behavior change intervention need to look, feel, sound, smell, or taste like health education? In fact, does it need to have anything to do with health at all? And so we've sort of termed this type of intervention which we take the focus on intrinsic motivators or motivation instead of on health, we call them stealth interventions. And we call them stealth interventions because physical activity and reduced inactivity or diet changes really become side effects of the intervention as opposed to what the, the participants see is what they're actually doing or what they're focused on. And our goal here is to identify target behaviors that are motivating in themselves or create target behaviors that are motivating in themselves. So I'm going to give you a couple examples. One is, how many of you played team sports when you were younger, or even now played team sports? So almost everybody. Well, for a lot of people, team sports are highly motivating. And it's because you're on a team, you have a coach, you have um, uniforms, there's challenge, there's competition, which is, which is uh, motivating. But for a lot of overweight kids, they want nothing to do with team sports because they're the last one picked on the team or they're the slowest one on the field. And so we have a lot of our patients who will just sit home and play video games or sit in front of the TV or sit in front of the refrigerator, um, even though they would rather be out playing with their friends. So we came up with the idea, and actually it was Dana Weintraub, who's one of our uh, general pediatricians, who uh, was a competitive soccer player, came up with the idea that could we create a league, a soccer league in particular, just for overweight kids. 
And if we did, would they show up? Well, it turned out that they said that they would come if, if we did it. And in fact, they did come. And their attendance rates were really high. So we did a little randomized control study uh, with funding from the Centers for Disease Control where we randomized kids, overweight kids, who were referred by their pediatrician. We randomized them to either be in an after-school soccer program uh, just for overweight kids or to be in a health education program where we taught them about nutrition. And we taught them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there are a lot of practical reasons to do that, but as you can see, the irony is well there too. But, and what turned out is over six months, the kids who were randomized to the soccer program actually lost significantly more weight and became much more physically active than the kids who were in the health education program. Okay, no surprise. And in fact, uh, we have uh, a proposal in now to actually try and expand this and actually try and follow the do a program where we follow kids for two to three years over this, this type of program. Um, another thing, another activity that we focused on is dance in girls. And in fact, um, we've been doing a lot of studies of ethnic dance in girls because it's something that the parents get excited about and, the, and, uh, and we've done a program of hip hop, step, and African dance in low income girls in Oakland. And uh, I'm gonna show you now a video of some dances from a program we're doing in Mexican American children in Redwood City where we have six schools and uh, participating. These are just all girls, so not just overweight girls. Six schools participating, and half the girls in each school are randomized to health education, and half are randomized to a health education program, half to being eligible to just join this after-school dance program where we don't talk about health at all. And it's focused on ballet folklorico, which is uh, regional Mexican dances. Each region of Mexico has its own costumes, its own music, its own styles of dance. And I'm going to show you, this is from a local high school, Garfield, or elementary school. And this is early in the program. And you can see we focus on making dance fun. Performance is highly motivating for these girls. Uh, they like to perform for their family and their, uh, their friends. The costumes, they get to work on choreography. And, and it, it's an amazing way to get kids to be physically active for about an hour, an hour and a half in the afternoon without them thinking they're being physically active. This is the same girls out doing a performance in the Clark Center out here across the street. About a month later, you can see they've improved quite a bit. See, they come in all shapes and sizes. The idea isn't necessarily to turn them into great ballet folklorico stars, but instead to really have them enjoy the fun of dancing and hopefully go on and continue being physically active. Now this is why I think I have the best job in the world. <laughs> I get to think up things like this and we go and do them yeah, with your tax dollars. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. With all the cuts that have been made in, in California in education and they eliminated sports programs in various school districts, uh, across the bay, uh, gotten rid of musical programs, etc. Um, and this is interesting, this is great. But realistically, how do we fund activities that get kids out and in the budget to be stripped out of the home? Yeah, the question is, with all the cuts being made, particularly in schools and government budgets and, and for programs for kids, how can we uh, fund things like this or programs like this so that we do have opportunities for kids. Well, in, in fact, there's a tremendous of opportunities in after-school programs, in schools as well, but the schools, uh, less and less are we doing things in class time because uh, teachers are so focused on testing and the testing outcomes. But after-school programs are everywhere and they really serve a major purpose and are major uh, benefit for parents, especially if you have two working parents or single parents who are working. Um, and so you'll find in almost every school district and even outside the districts, lots and lots of after-school programs. The YMCA is one of the biggest providers of after-school programs, boys and girls clubs, uh, parks and recs department. We're doing this in cooperation with the parks and rec department. Um, there are also, for programs like this, there are lots of, of parents in the, in the neighborhood. Now, we can't hire parents because some of them aren't um, legal, aren't, aren't documented and things. So. Uh, so we can't necessarily hire a lot of the, the parents of the kids who work with us. But um, there are programs that are started up by volunteers all over the place. There's lots of money going into after-school programs now. In fact, the state 
despite the budget woes of the state, the state has budgets for after school funding that has allowed to use for physical activity programs and health, not just academic uh, enhancement. Um, and you're going to see much, much more. I'm actually more optimistic than I've ever been about public health changes. I was, I had the pleasure of um, getting to go to the White House a few weeks ago and uh, to, to be in a session with the President's Task Force on Obesity Prevention in Children. And, you know, a decade ago I was in the USDA when, when the Surgeon General traveled across town to the USDA and it was considered newsworthy that someone from Health and Human Services would actually come across town and show up in a different agency, the Department of Agriculture. Um, I was last, or two weeks ago when I was in Washington, I was in a room with the Secretary of Education, the Secretary of the Interior, all the, all the organizations that Dr. Morton talked about, the Surgeon General, the, uh, the Peter Orzag, the um, Man Office of Management, of Bud Management and Budget, you know, everybody and the, the First Lady, everybody is coming together. This is the first time anybody in, in my experience uh, has ever seen uh, all of these agents to agencies talking together. And so I think you're going to see movement. Education uh, and Interior, who governs the Park Service and other things, they all see their role in this, uh, in this issue. Um, and you're seeing them start to work together to try and make resources available. Um, already, the school food uh, nutrition bill, the child nutrition reauthorization, looks like it's going to go, well, it's being proposed by the Senate at least, for an extra um, uh, $450 million a year for school meals. We haven't seen an increase in school meals compensation since the 70s. So there is movement going on. So just to finish up, because I'm at the end, and then I'll, we'll take questions if you want. Um, to summarize, uh, hopefully I've painted you a picture that, or both of us, that obesity is really a public health crisis and something that we need to address. There are many causes, in particular what we call the tox toxic environment, is that we have our, our biology, but it's expressed when we, when we change the environment. Um, research is finding a lot of innovative solutions, whether it be for individual patients or for populations. And I think it really needs to be a global, national, local, and personal priority. All of us need to take some responsibility because, as Dr. Morton showed, we're all going to be paying for it. In fact, we're already paying for it now. And it's going to have a huge impact on everything from national security to, um, to economic stability. So thank you very much, and then we'll take questions. Well, let me thank um, both of our speakers for wonderful presentations. Uh, this is a, as you can gather, a truly um, important problem. And I think uh, the last comment you heard really rings true. It is a matter of personal responsibility. So whether you're a consumer, as we all are ourselves, or you're a parent or a grandparent, you know, you can have um, an impact. And I think that is something to really uh, resonate to. So. Uh, we're at time, um, and I know that uh, both Dr. Uh, Morton and Robinson agreed to take some questions up front, so if you'd like to come forward, do that. I think next week we move from obesity to aging. Uh, you know, I have interest in both of these areas, so <laughs> we'll see you next week. Come forward if you'd like. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.